Peace, peace, peace. What's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Eddie Leonard, and I am a producer, beat scientist, sampler, and someone who spends way too much of his discretionary income on analog equipment. Uh, for what purpose? I don't know. But experimentation and exploring all of these different possibilities of sound. So one of the things I wanted to explore um, and a question I wanted to pose is are eight outs in an MPC actually better than the stereo output? And that's a question that I ask a lot of my friends in the beat making community. Um, and the answers differ, they really vary. Um, so what I wanted to do is just sort of explore that right now with y'all. So I got a beat that I cooked up this morning. Um, and what I wanna do is play it first out of the stereo out. So let's just see what this sounds like. No, not that one. This one. Turn that up a little. Cool. Sounds cool. Basic groove, you know, a little boom bappy vibe. Now let's see what it sounds like coming out of the eight outs. Hmm. I gotta fix that part. So I'm like... So what's the difference we're hearing? Um, who am I to say what's better or what's worth? I'm gonna say all I'm going to say and advocate is that if you have an MPC with eight analog outs and you're completely ignoring them, you are missing the point. Um, I think, you know, three reasons basically if I could break it down. Number one is control. If you have a mixer, just any basic mixer, the very fact of sending each individual out, let's say your kicks are on channel one like mine, the fact that you're putting your kicks on their own separate channel in a mixer, having control over EQ, hopefully three or four band EQ, so you can really carve out you know its space in the in the spectrum the frequency spectrum with your hands with that whole tactile experience i think that is reason enough to use uh eight outs just off the bat there is something nice about the stereo outs and the glue that it provides for the mix as you heard in the beat that just played i think the bass and the kick actually sat a little bit better in that but overall i feel like there's a little bit more space a little bit more stereo width and that probably has to do with the panning um, but I do think that there's a lot to be gained just from using a mixer um, number two and this is the biggest for me is just outboard gear uh, when I was coming up it was not easy to get an MPC I'm talking like mid 90s early 2000s this was a rare sort of thing you had to have money you had to know how to do it there was no YouTube videos um, so it's just sort of a it's sort of a thing where to be honest, back then, just having the equipment, you could be dope. Like anybody, if you had an SP-1200 and you were just making just a mediocre beat, whatever. But nowadays, with the democratization of sampling and of equipment especially, anybody can mimic any sound if you do enough work in your DAW or in your MP, especially these new MPs. They're crazy what they can do. So the fact that you can do absolutely anything makes it so that it's not about the sound that you have, but how you treat that sound and how you add texture and color to that sound. And I think one of the best ways of doing that is getting creative with your eight outputs. So eight outs, I mean eight outs, each one going to its each channel. But the way that I have mine set up, before it gets to the mixer, it's going through outboard gear. We all know what this is, they're called inserts. This is where I think it gets interesting, and this is that magic kind of fairy dust that people put on their beats or music that people tend to overlook, which is like the creative art of not just mixing, but of processing. So for me, my channel one, I have my kick. My kick is going to an Art Pro VLA compressor. And I'm just saying this just to show the difference. It's very subtle, but there is a difference. So it's going through one compressor, and then it goes into a Pultec clone, you know? So it's a, you know, it's one of the, any, any clone you want, but it's a passive EQ that gives me a little bit of a bump at 60 and cuts out some of the highs, right? 
the hats, I have that going straight to the mixer. The snare goes to a VCA compressor, then goes to the mixer. My bass goes to the same Art Pro VLA, then goes to an RS-124, the Chandler Limited compressor, which is one of the best sounding compressors I've ever heard. Um, and then it goes to another passive EQ just to sort of give it a little boost, uh, about 100K. So that makes my bass, you know, just a little bit, it just gives a little bit, you know, it makes it, it makes it stick out a little bit more, um, and gives it a little bit of a bigger bottom, to be honest. Um, but then channel five, I have going through a DBX compressor that I have under my desk. Channel six, I have going through another RS-124. Channel seven, going through a reverb. And channel eight, going through a different reverb and a digital delay. All of this gives me added control and texture over my beats so that when I'm making something, especially something simple like this, it can stay simple, but it's about the sound and the way that the sounds hit and the way the sounds sit together. And that goes to my third point, which really ties in with the second, where the democratization of equipment and of samples, basically, where back in the day, you know, I was one of those people that was like digging through records for days and days and the best way to find records was to actually go to stores that nobody people had never been to. So you go out to the country or go out of the country into the cuts, go to India, go to Brazil, go to Cape Town or South Africa, wherever you can, where you could find record stores that other producers had not been. That's what you had to do to get that sound that other people had never had before. And that's what differentiated your beats from other people. Now, the rarest sample in the world you could just pick up on YouTube for, you know, for free in a matter of seconds. So sounds and samples are in it. It's about two things. I think it's how you flip those samples. So if you're really talented at flipping samples and manipulating them to make them yours, then that's all you. That's great. But I think the most important thing is how you flip them, but also how you treat them. And that's the sonic texture that you give them. You could take the simplest sample in the world, but if you run it through the right equipment, if you layer it and treat it right, I think that's going to what that's what's going to make the music stand out a little bit more than just relying on your equipment or some magical sound and some, you know, sampler or uh, drum machine to to create this like lo-fi vibe or something like that, you know. And even words like lo-fi are funny because back then we were they just called us weirdos. <laughs> you know, we were like, you know, people who were just weird kids who are running around sampling records and making all this avant-garde experimental jazzy hip-hop music uh you know jazzy electronic beats we were beat heads basically and now that it's become a sound i think that's great but i think that it's important to keep pushing the sound keep elevating it and in order to do that we have to not rely on our equipment but rely on our equipment to you know speak through our equipment use our equipment to enhance the sound and create new sonic capabilities so I think that if you have an MPC and you've got eight outs and you're not using them creatively I think you might be missing out on an incredible opportunity to sort of enhance your sound and deepen your sound and get deeper into something that could basically define your own texture and add to this landscape of music that we're all contributing to um, let me know if you prefer the eight outs or the stereo out if you have any thoughts on this um yeah <laughs>